Hello and welcome. Today's show will be the NASA media briefing at the agency's headquarters in Washington to discuss the findings from an unidentified anomalous phenomena independent study team it commissioned back in 2022. About 20 minutes ago, right before the hearing, the agency published the team's full report online. That link is in the description box below, which aims to inform NASA on what possible data could be collected in the future to shed light on the nature and origin of UAP and UFOs. Currently, we are waiting for NASA to launch their briefing. I'm very excited, just like yourself, and yet I have no expectations, not a single expectation. Um, I am reading the report practically alongside with you, but it is something that, again, you can find in the description box right here. Before we start, I did take a little bit of a little snippet from that PDF, and it says here, NASA's UAP independent study team is made up of 16 ex experts, experts, excuse me, from diverse backgrounds in science, technology, data, artificial intelligence, space exploration, aerospace safety, media, and commercial innovation. They were assigned to pinpoint the data available around UAP and produce a report that outlines a roadmap for how NASA can use its tools of science to obtain data to evaluate and categorize the nature of UAP going forward. This is not a review of previous UAP incidents. And that's a great point to make. While people in the community, they want to see cases revised and studied, and hey, look, me too. That's not what this is about. So it's it's an interesting read. I haven't finished it. I would lie to you if I said that I did. But so far, does it seem promising based off of this PDF? I think that just having this conversation is promising. But what is odd is, first of all, this this briefing is late. Like it, we went, we went to get it a while ago and we are receiving it late. Aside from that, this came out a day or two after the Mexican UAP hearing. Um, is that a coincidence? Were they timing this for a long period of time? We don't know, as in you and I. We're not sure here, but I do find it rather odd that we are getting it right after the Mexican UAP hearing. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so that we can see as soon as it streams and it's starting right now. Oh, no, just kidding. It, it was going to, and then it went back to this. So that's a little bit disappointing right there. But thank you for everyone watching this live with me. We are, these are really exciting times. It's amazing that NASA is having these conversations. And while many might not agree with NASA's viewpoints or the, the, the saying of never a straight answer, because there's such a prestigious organization, at least what many classify as prestigious, it's a very big deal that they are talking about UFOs, UAP, to the public and using this scientific standpoint. Many people say, oh, bring in the scientists, bring in the researchers. Let's make this look as serious as possible. And in some respects, NASA is doing that. Now, are they going to say, yes, aliens are here? No. No, I don't think ever, at least not anytime soon. But it's a great start to inspire other researchers to come forward, to maybe want to be a part of these types of teams, to speak at these kinds of panels. So just it, it's these little steps that's going to make a very big difference in the future. But I'm happy that everyone caught this live. I'm reading Derek. Woo! I caught a live stream. Yay! <laughs> Well, we're doing this pretty early. This is pretty early in the morning, at least on the on the West Coast here. So we are just waiting on NASA. And I will unmute that. Just kidding. We're not going to have that until we are ready for the stream. But I would like to say that the, you know, the YouTube algorithm just isn't friendly with the UFO topic. So if you share this video and more importantly, hit the like button, it helps so much. Right now we have 1400 people watching this live. Let's get to at least 500 likes because we want to say, hey, YouTube, we want more coverage on the UFO, 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 UAP topic. Come on, let's do this. 
So please hit the like button, subscribe. Tomorrow will be Strange Weekly News at 3 p.m. PST, where I'll be covering all the weird news and mysterious headlines from around the world. That will be live, and you do not want to miss that. We do a lot of live shows right here on this channel. And yes, we did cover the UFO Mexican hearing live, and we also did an analysis on that hearing yesterday take a look at that. It is worth your time uh, because we do go into detail on the mummies that were shown that it is nothing new, but it was very interesting that they showed it at this hearing um, in Mexico just a few days ago. So we are waiting on them. It's officially 7 a.m. PST, 10 a.m. EST. So it should be starting rather shortly. But let me ask you this. What are your expectations, if any? What would you like to see? What do you think will be delivered, especially for those that haven't read the PDF report yet? What are you expecting to see? Let me know in the live chat. Please let me know in the comments as well. I, I do try to read all of the comments. So, Abe says my expectations is negative 10. Okay. No, I, I, I think a lot of people have those kind of expectations. I hear you. But this is a great step forward. Let's see. George says, after Mexico, let's go get boring. No, I, I hear you on that. That hearing was really something else. It was unexpected, to say the least. Can NASA deliver after Mexico? I'm not sure here. I am I am not sure. Oh, here we go. Oh, and welcome. We are here today at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. for a press briefing on a report from an independent study team on unidentified anomalous phenomena. We have four speakers here today. We have Bill Nelson, our NASA administrator, Nikki Fox, the associate administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Dan Evans, the Assistant Deputy Associate Administrator for Research within the Science Mission Directorate, and David Spurgle, who is the President of the Simons Foundation and was also the Chair of this particular independent study team. Uh, I will ask everybody in the room to please silence your cell phones. Uh, we will get started with uh, everybody giving a few opening remarks, and then we will take questions. We will take questions both in the room and then from the phones. And for now, I will hand it over to the administrator. Thanks so much, and thanks for coming today. NASA searches for the unknown in air and space. It's in our DNA. From digging on Mars with the Perseverance rover in those little titanium tubes that we intend to go back and pick up, digging in a dry lake bed near the mouth of a river. Now we're going up to the top of the cliff where uh, the scientists feel that there could be the best uh, examples of if there were life there millions of years ago. Uh, whether we're dealing with Perseverance or the James Webb Space Telescope, which searches for exoplanets with signs of habitability, we are looking for signs of life, past and present. And it's in our DNA to explore and to ask why things are the way they are. In June of last year, NASA commissioned an independent study team to examine unidentified anomalous phenomena. We did so with a few goals in mind. First, to examine how NASA can use our expertise and instruments to study UAP from a scientific perspective. Second, shift the conversation about UAP from sensationalism to science and to make sure that whatever we find or whatever we recommend 
to make sure that information is shared transparently around the world. There's a global fascination with UAP. On my travels, one of the first questions I often get is about these sightings. And much of that fascination is due to the unknown nature of it. Think about it. Most UAP sightings result in very limited data. That makes it even more difficult to draw scientific conclusions about the nature of UAP. And so this independent study team brought together some of the world's leading scientists, data, and artificial intelligence experts, aerospace safety specialists, all with a specific charge from me, which is to tell how to apply the full focus of science and data to UAP. And this is the first time that NASA has taken concrete action to seriously look into UAP. Uh, and this independent study team was just that, independent. Now, NASA has a statutory authority to look for life in the universe. And when you think of the universe, and especially what we have learned from the James Webb Space Telescope, how vast that it is. We knew before, and it was a NASA scientist, Dr. John Mather, who got the Nobel uh, that determined that the universe was 13.8 billion years old. And over the years, particularly accelerated in the last century, uh, we have an understanding that, of course, ours is not the only galaxy. And there are billions and billions of galaxies, and each of those galaxies, including our own, have billions and billions of stars. And with the James Webb looking at the exoplanets, we are now beginning to discover, and somewhere out there, we will discover another medium-sized stony planet around a medium-sized sun or star at just the right distance, not too far, not too close, with a tilt in its axis that rotates, that has carbon, that will have a habitable atmosphere. If you ask me, do I believe there's life in a universe that is so vast that it's hard for me to comprehend how big it is? My personal answer is yes. But I asked some of our scientists, as a matter of fact, uh, the Washington Post editorial board asked us to come down to the question, what is the mathematical probability that there is life out there in the universe? And if you calculate in billions of stars, in billions of galaxies, that there's replicated what I just said, another stony planet. The answer was, what's the likelihood? At least a trillion. That's from our scientist. So we start this without any preconceived notions, but understanding that we're in a world of discovery. And we have taken, we NASA have taken for the first time concrete action to seriously look into UAP. And this independent study team is exactly that. It's independent. They work to develop recommendations about how NASA could better examine them from a scientific perspective. And the top takeaway from the study 
is that there is a lot more to learn. The NASA independent study team did not find any evidence that UAP have an extraterrestrial origin, but we don't know what these UAP are. That's why I'm announcing that NASA has appointed a NASA director of UAP research. They are being tasked with developing and overseeing the implementation of NASA's vision for UAP research. We will use NASA's expertise to work with other agencies to analyze UAP. We will use AI and machine learning to search the skies for anomalies as we have been searching the heavens and will continue to search the heavens for habitability. And NASA will do this transparently. So while today is a significant step for NASA, it's certainly not our final step. And we're going to share more with you. And I want to introduce you to Dr. Nikki Fox, who is the head of our science mission directory. Nikki. Good morning. And thank you so much, Administrator Nelson. It's always tough to follow Bill. He's such a great speaker. Um, but I want to thank the uh, independent uh, study team for um, their amazing service on the study and for their continued contributions towards the advancement of our nation's understanding of unidentified anomalous phenomena. UAP, as, as Bill just eloquently said, UAP are one of our planet's greatest mysteries. And it's really due to the limited number of high quality data that surrounds such incidents and often renders them unidentifiable. While there are numerous eyewitness accounts and visuals associated with UAP, they're not consistent, they're not detailed, and they're not curated observations that can be used to make definitive scientific conclusions about the nature and the origin of UAP. The language of scientists is data, and data points towards a scientific conclusion to what the nature and the origin of UAP could be. That leads us to why we're here today. The independent study team's report is now public and it can be found at uh, NASA, uh, sorry, science.nasa.gov slash UAP. While NASA is still working to evaluate the report and to assess the independent study team's finding and recommendations, NASA is committed to immediately contributing to the federal government's unified UAP effort and as you heard, we have appointed a director of UAP research. In their role, uh, they will centralize communications, resources, and data analytical capabilities across the federal government to establish a robust database for the uh, evaluation of any future data. Additionally, our director of UAP research will also leverage NASA's expertise in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and space-based observation tools that will support and enhance the broader government initiative into UAP. They will serve as NASA's point of contact for government entities, but especially for the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARROW. And this will ensure our co uh, coordinated efforts and effective communication channels. Beyond our director of UAP research, uh, NASA will also advance citizen reporting by working with the public and commercial pilots to collect a broader set of data to add to the, uh, the vast data repositories to not only contribute to a broader, more reliable data set for future UAP incidents, but to also contribute to the destigmatization of the important study of UAPs. And with that, it is my great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Dan Evans, who is the uh, NASA official responsible for supporting this amazing study. Good morning. I'd like to begin by expressing my sincere thanks to NASA Administrator Bill Nelson for directing this study. 
We at NASA believe that understanding UAP is vital for several reasons. First and foremost, it provides an opportunity for us to expand our understanding of the world around us. At NASA, we are committed to charting the uncharted. So this work aligns with who we are. Secondly, this study aims to enhance situational awareness. The presence of UAP raises serious concerns about the safety of our skies. And it's this nation's obligation to determine whether these phenomena pose any potential risks to airspace safety. Let's not forget that the first A in NASA is aeronautics. So by understanding the nature of UAP, we can ensure that our skies remain a safe space for all. Administrator Nelson directed us to put together an independent and external team of world leading experts to produce a report containing a roadmap with a series of recommendations that describe how NASA could best help in the cross government response to UAP. Months of meticulous fact finding, cross disciplinary collaboration and scientific rigor gave the team insights that will greatly enhance our nation's understanding of UAP going forward. The team's report, now available on NASA's website, stands as a testament to NASA's and the team's commitment to transparency, to the power of science, and to the unwavering quest for knowledge. We at NASA believe that studying UAP represents an exciting step forward in our journey to uncover the mysteries of the world around us. By embracing a scientific lens, we have ensured that our work is evidence-based and data-driven. And by valuing transparency and openness, we have aimed to foster trust and collaboration with the public. I'd like to conclude by extending my deepest gratitude to the team for their incredible dedication and service. Their efforts have been instrumental, and I truly appreciate the expertise and commitment that each of them have brought to this endeavor. And with that, I'll pass over to Dr. David Spurgle, who chaired our study. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to extend our sincere gratitude to the NASA Administrator for entrusting us with this pivotal study. Your faith in our capabilities has been a driving force behind the panel's approach. The panel's comprehensive study into unidentified anomalous phenomena, or UAP, has led to several crucial findings, and I'd like to elucidate on our methodology and those findings this morning. We began by rigorously assessing the current state of UAP data. Our goal was not to repeat the work of our, the arrow, but to understand the nature of the reports. Our goal was to produce a roadmap for NASA to contribute to the understanding of the nature of UAP events. We looked at NASA's assets. While they provide a comprehensive picture of the ocean, the Earth's surface and atmosphere for studying our evolving planet, they typically do not have the resolution needed for UAP events. However, by providing data on environmental conditions, they can complement other data on UAP. The current approach to UAP data collection has led to a limited sample of events and limited data. Stigma has limited reporting by pilots, both civilian and military, so we know there's missing data. For its analysis in other areas, NASA always takes a scientific approach of systematic data collection that involves calibrating instruments, multiple measurements, and ensuring sensor metadata. Most UAP events lack this quality of data. One of NASA's contribution to the broader governmental effort to bring these methodologies to create a data set is to bring these methodologies to create a data set that's both reliable and extensive. And once we have a, well, a set large sample of well-characterized events, um, AI and ML tools, which are proving to be powerful in so many other applications, will likely prove helpful in identifying interesting anomalies. It is essential to clarify 
based on our current findings and methodology, that we find no evidence to suggest that UAP are extraterrestrial in origin. Our focus is understanding the phenomenon, however, regardless of the source. And previous work from the IRO has shown that most events are explainable as planes, balloons, drones, weather phenomenon, and instrument features. And in any search for interesting anomalies, the first step is to eliminate the chaff of conventional events before moving on to identify novel phenomena. In this, the public's role cannot be overstated. The panel envisioned a framework that leverages crowdsourcing, possibly via smartphone applications to capture a broader spectrum of data, ensuring more eyes and ears on the ground. Lastly, we delved into the safety concerns UAP present within US airspace. By integrating UAP collection within our current aviation reporting system, the panel believes we can provide insights into potential safety risks. NASA can reduce the stigma associated with pilots reporting anomalies. And fundamentally, by studying events we don't understand, we advance our understanding. So in conclusion, with a rigorous methodology, collaborative efforts, public engagement, NASA can be a key player in the whole of government approach to understanding UAP. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. We will start taking questions. Uh, for those in the room, we have a microphone over here that we would ask you to speak into. We will also be alternating with uh, questions from those on the phone line. For those of you who are in the phone line, uh, please press star one to get onto the queue. Uh, we will try to answer as many as we can today. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Please, sir. Thank you very much. This is directed to Mr. Nelson. Thank you for being here. Um, two quick questions. One is, how can we make the determination of what something isn't when we don't know what it is? And B, after a careful review of the data, if it's determined that some, underline the word some 10 times, UFOs or UAP originate from a non-human intelligence, what's the plan to disclose that to the public? And can you identify yourself, please? James Fox. Thank you. I'm sorry, and what outlet? Uh, independent Media. Thank you. Well, let me repeat. It's on. Let me repeat what I said. Uh, I think it's important that you hear this word for word. The NASA independent study team did not find any evidence that UAP have an extraterrestrial origin, but we don't know what these UAP are. Uh, the mission of NASA is to find out the unknown. I've said several times in my comments here today that we NASA deal openly, and we will be transparent on this. And we're trying to address the, uh, the question of there's so much uh, concern that there's something locked up, classified, uh, and that the, the American government is not being open. Uh, well, we are the American government, and we are open, and we're going to be open about this. We don't Again, I'm going to repeat that statement, but we don't know what these UAP are, but we're going to try to find out. Thank you very much. And is there a plan in place if it is determined that some of them represent or originate from a non-human intelligence to, to tell the public? Is there a plan or? If we are what I said we intend to be, which is transparent, you bet your boots, uh, we will say that. And I've tried to set the table for you by telling you what I personally believe in a universe that is so vast that could there be a replication of life on Earth elsewhere in another solar system that is so big? Of course, I believe that. The distances 
it would have to be a very advanced civilization. The distances, you know, light years, hundreds of light years, billions of light years. Uh, but whatever we find, we're going to tell you. Thank Great, you very we'll, much. Great. And we'll move on to the next question. Please do identify yourself. Thanks. Uh, this is Joey Roulette from Reuters. Um, question for Bill Nelson or any of the other panelists. Um, so you've appointed a director of UAP research. Have you named someone to that role? And what kind of investment are you considering making in this? Is this going to be a new program office? Have you thought of funding figures, et cetera? Thanks. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, we've already appointed uh, the person. They've been working there for a, a, a while now, um, like during the study, to to help be a, a point of contact. Um, and we, we, you know, the any budget discussions, of course, are very are part of a very intricate federal budget request, and so they're they're not not something that we discuss openly. Um, but we will certainly look at what resources need to be allocated. Can, can you name the official who's? In we will world? not give his name out no. Thank you. We'll take another one from in the room. Hello, um, Dan Rivers from British Broadcaster ITV News. Um, I heard the word stigma mentioned several times that you want to remove the stigma. Is your message to pilots and other people that this is no longer the preserve of, of cranks and that you won't be laughed at and that you will take them seriously? Is that the takeaway? That is exactly uh, the message. I mean, at NASA, we, 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 we love, we're scientists, we love data, we love all data. And if there is something that needs to be reported and need, we, we want people to be able to feel that they can report that. Um, you know, we spoke in the, in the open hearing that we had here just a few months ago. Dan, remind me when it was? May 31st. May 31st. Um, and we actually talked then about um, the, we wanted to remove the stigma, and we also did not tolerate any of the abuse that um, some of our members of the panel were receiving, particularly on social media, um, for, for doing this really important scientific study. So absolutely, we want pilots and uh, both, um, as Bill said, you know, both, both private pilots, um, uh, commercial pilots, uh, military pilots to feel that if they see something, they, they need to report it. I, I, I want to say, and I want to repeat the way I said it, we want to shift the conversation about UAPs from sensationalism yeah. to science. Yeah. I, I think of this in terms of the signs we see around for security, which say, if you see something, say see something. something. Mm -hmm. I think in this context, we would summarize it as, if you see something, collect high quality data on it, because then we can learn. If I may, I just noticed in the report, the, the go fast incident was one that was picked out and that had been uh, held up as an example of a, of a very credible sighting that you seem to be pouring doubt on. Can you just talk to that? I mean, we looked at that as one example. And, you know, I think this is something um, that um, Arrow has actually done a very good job of, of going through the events. And most events um, are going to turn out, even if there are some events that in the end turn out to be something novel, most events are going to turn out to be conventional things, balloons, airplanes, and so on. Um, I think of the process of discovery of anomalies as looking for a needle in a haystack. And if you want to find a needle in a haystack, you've got two choices. Either you know exactly what the needle looks like and you design a very good filter to look for the needle. It's called match filtering in, our mach in sort of AI work, machine learning, stable processing. Or you don't know what you're looking for. And with anomalies, that's really the case we're in. We're looking for things we don't understand. So if you want to find something strange in a haystack, you better know exactly what hay looks like. And you better be able to characterize that really well. And that's why in a process like this, and this is something that I think we bring to this as we look for anomalies, is you need to know what typical regular things look like under all conditions. You need to know what balloons look like when pilots see them. So under unusual conditions, so that you can eliminate those events. And that's why in identifying anomalies, understanding the normal is a very important part of it. 
and understanding that under different observing conditions and collecting data in a, in a uniform way. I mean, this is what we do when we study anomalies in, in space science or our other areas of science. And what we're trying to do is bring this approach to this field by saying, collect high quality data, understand the normal events, and that's how we move things forward. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question, please. Uh, hello, um, I'm Nomia Iqbal from BBC News. Um, just to follow up on the stigma um, question, uh, UAP, that, that term has been you know, used in part to destigmatize UFOs. The fact is most people use UFOs. Most of the American public, most of the world use that term. So I wonder how much is the stigma still a problem for you and what are you practically doing to, to about it really, to convince people? And second, my second very quick question, in your report I noticed that you said AI is a very essential tool for identifying rare occurrences. Mm -hmm. Yesterday we were at this big AI summit where you had 100 senators meeting all the big tech tycoons, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and, you know, speaking to some senators afterwards, they said, we are concerned about AI, we need it to be regulated. Does that concern you? Are you worried that it might hamper your work? Thank you very much. Well, two big questions. <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, do I personally believe that AI needs to be, uh, have some boundaries? The answer to that for our existentialism Yes. Uh, can you do that within the appropriate bounds so that, as I said in my remarks, that we're going to utilize AI as one of the tools as we search uh, for what is an answer to the UAP? And uh, so, no, I don't think that uh, uh, any attempts to uh, that the Congress has underway to try to write a law that would appropriately uh, put uh, guardrails around AI for other reasons is in any way going to inhibit us from utilizing the tools of AI to help us in our quest on this specific issue. Now, what was your other question? Just how do you stigma, uh, destigmatize uh, the whole thing? Because I know you call it UAPs, but um, uh, you know people don't refer it to in that way. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's a mindset. Uh, we all are entertained by Indiana Jones uh, in the Amazon and finding the crystal skull. Uh, so there's there's a lot of uh, a folklore out there. Uh, that's why we entered the stage, the arena, to try to get into this uh, from a science point. I think you can blame the X-Files for a lot of this as well. <laughs> uh, that possibly too, but just remember what I said. We, we, are, we, NASA, are trying to shift it from sensationalism to science. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. And we do have a long line in the room, but I want to give a couple uh, chances to some people on the phone line. So I'm going to go to the phone for our first question there. Please do introduce yourself and ask a question. The phone, can you hear me? Our first, our first question is from Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Your line is open. Uh, yes, hi, Marsha Dunn, AP. Um, I'm already receiving emails on Area 51 in Roswell, so I would like to ask Mr. Spurkel, um, how much were you and your fellow panel members hassled or bombarded by this sort of thing during the course of your study? And it, uh, for NASA, are you not naming the director of UAP research for this very reason so that they're not hassled and bombarded by the fringe element? Thanks. No, I would um, divide kind of emails and tweets into two types, right? There's some where people honestly are curious about things they've seen, they've heard, you know, there are things that are hard to respond to, like my uncle who's dead saw something strange and you get a report. And, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's not useful, but that's harmless. 
On the other hand, one of the things that happened during the study, and this may be part of a bigger discussion of cultural behavior on social media, where people behave badly, and I would say harassed some of our panel members, and that I think is, you know, is, was very inappropriate behavior, behavior one doesn't want to see. Um, sadly, I think it's part of a deeper problem when people somehow feel on the web, on me, social media, they can be nasty and hostile. And we, and sadly, some of our panel members experience that. Yeah, I would just simply add to that uh, to say that not only were some of the the things that our panel members received during the course of this study, simple trolling. Some of them actually ro rose to, to actual threats. And as a result, you know, we at NASA take you know, the sanctity of the scientific process and the security and safety of our team extremely seriously. And yes, that's in part why we are not splashing the name of our new director out there, um, because science needs to be free science needs to to undergo a real and rigorous and rational process and you need the freedom of thought to be able to do that um, some of the threats and the harassment have been uh, beyond the pale quite frankly towards some of our panelists and yes it's important that science be free as part of that process thank you so much we will go to another question on the phone please please go ahead and introduce yourself our next question comes from Tom Clark with Sky News London. Your line is open. Oh, hi there. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I want to understand whether and how much, you won't give us an idea of money, but how much, many assets or new research programs will be devoted to this by the administration. Because it strikes me that although the argument for aviation safety is clear, uh, there are other departments and agencies responsible for that particular thing. And as the report concludes, the likelihood of there being extraterrestrial explanations or truly scientific explanations for many of these phenomena is very, very small. Shouldn't NASA devote its research budgets and its efforts to those much more likely and tangible uh, signs of extraterrestrial life through things like the James Webb Space Telescope or extrasolar planets detection. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so yes, yeah, so obviously we, we, we don't discuss budget openly, um, but uh, we are committed to supporting uh, the, the whole of government uh, study into UAP. Um, all of our data are open. Um, in fact, if you look at the supple if you look at the report, you'll see a very large sort of back uh, you know, background material or supplemental material in there because we literally released everything because uh, that's what we do at NASA. Um, we do have our key uh, agency goals. We have obviously our, our goals in the science mission directorate, our, our themes that we, we follow. And one of those, as the administrator described, is the search for life elsewhere. And we do that. Um, and, and he described the research beautifully. I think he may be going for my job actually, but um, he, uh, he described the research so well that um, what we need to find is a rocky planet around a, you know, a hospitable star that isn't too violent, uh, that is in just that right place that has um, signatures of water and signatures of carbon, so the building blocks of life. And we continue to, to strive to do that. We do that with the James Webb Telescope. We'll be doing that when we launch the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope uh, that even has a coronagraph around it to block out the light of the neighboring stars and really let us look at those those um, those possible planets. And then beyond that, uh, the next um, big telescope recommended by the Astrophysics Decadal is, is the Habitable Worlds Observatory, actually a mission designed to look for hospitable and find like Earth 2.0 in another stellar system. And so they, they really are in the forefront of our goals at NASA. So thanks so much for the question. I'm gonna ask- I just jump in to clarify something. Um, will you be devoting any new resource or research projects to this particular aim then, given that's where the interesting questions really are, should we spend, should NASA spend uh, time and budget pursuing the much less likely task of, of finding signs of extraterrestrial life in small objects within or close to the Earth's atmosphere. 
So, I mean, most of our, I mean, obviously our instruments are designed to look for the phenomena that we, that we study at NASA. If any of our data are useful, if any of our data are applicable, then we absolutely will, will be devoting that and turning that over through our, our liaison to, to uh, the, the whole of government approach. Um, we, we are not at this time intending to, to design a mission to do this. Um, that is not part of our, our kind of overarching NASA um, uh, direction. Um, we, we, we are looking at uh, uh, providing some research support. Um, so if somebody wants to write a, a research proposal, um, send it in through the, through the regular channels. Um, we will be looking for uh, ways to, to do that. And we also talked about um, supporting sort of the citizen science and the broader um, like repository of data. Dan, do you want to add to that? NASA's data are free and publicly accessible for the entire world to download. And we pride ourselves on that fact. And it's this openness of data and our approach, which is why we're all here today. Uh, to answer your specific question about devoting research budgets to the, the potentially truly interesting ones, well, I think as David said, you have to understand the chaff in order to really understand and pinpoint the potentially interesting ones, okay? So we are in such a data poor regime at the moment that we need to turn it into a data rich one to do that. We employ NASA's assets, many other partners' assets as well in that quest. And if your question suggests, and I do not know that it does, but if it suggests that NASA ought to keep its nose out of this, well, let me tell you, NASA is not a place that's going to hide its head in the sand. Um, now, is there interest in this phenomenon in other, other agencies? In my previous life in the Senate, I was privy to talk to the Navy pilots and to see the video of what they encountered off the coast of California in 2004. That was in a classified setting then. But this is now, and you have now seen that video, and you have heard uh, from those former Navy pilots. Uh, is that of a concern to the Department of Defense? Of course it is. Uh, and uh, therefore, we're going to continue our search from a scientific point of view. It's going to be uh, if those other agencies continued their search, we're going to be glad to join in with them. But our stuff is going to be open. Great. I'm going to take one more from the phone before we go back to the floor. Um, I will. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I am going to hope we can stick to sort of one per person. Uh, and and see how many we can get through. So one more from the phone, please. Our next question comes from Jeff Faust with Space News. Your line is open. Hi. Um, I know the press release states that uh, NASA is still evaluating the uh, independent study team's report and its recommendations. Does NASA plan to publish a formal response to the report and its recommendations? And if so, what timeline can we expect to see that? So, so let me give you a, a quick preview about how this works. So we, we have only very, very recently uh, received the report and what you have seen today in our press release represents our initial actions in recognition of the urgency of this matter. And yes, we will be following up uh, as appropriate with additional actions, yes, the recommendations and act on them in light of you know, budget and many other priorities. But we'll be announcing more in the future. Great, thank you. Please, back to the room. Identify yourself too, please. Uh, good morning, Sam Cabral with BBC News Digital. Um, we've been talking a lot about since shift from sensationalism to science today. Uh, has NASA been in touch with the Mexican authorities about the rather sensational revelations earlier this week of two allegedly non-human corpses? And what, of any importance, do you attach to these discoveries? I think David had a, yeah. a prep for that one. Well. You know, this is something that uh, we, I, I know I've only seen on Twitter. So it's, you know, um, when we have unusual things, you want to make data public. I think of this as like 
NASA has one of the most valuable samples from outer space, lunar rocks. What do we do? We make them available to any scientists who want to work on this. We don't know the nature of those samples that were shown in front of them. If I was the Mexican government, I would rec are making recommendations to the Mexican government. That's not our charge here. We're doing this for NASA. My recommendation was if you have something strange, make samples available to the world scientific community and we'll see what's there. I'll just add for one of the, the main goals of what we're trying to do here today is to move conjecture and conspiracy towards science and sanity. And you do that with data, as David says. And that's the whole purpose of this study and this roadmap. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Brandy Vincent from Defense Scoop. Thank you all for doing this. Um, I actually have two lines of questions, if it's okay. First, for Ms. Fox, what's the timeline um, and immediate actions that NASA is pursuing specifically with Aero um, now that the report has been completed? And what mechanisms are NASA and DOD really using to share information and collaborate securely? Um, and do you see more coming? And then separately, um, for Mr. Spurgle, I noticed in the final report, a lot of the um, images and media that were added were from DOD, snapshots that we'd previously seen from DOD data. Um, not much from FAA, if anything, not from other agencies. Can you speak to why that is um, and, and what, what all you used beyond DOD to inform your report? Dr. Fox, Dr. Spurgle, I'll pass it to you guys. Um, sure. So. Uh, Yes, we, our immediate actions, I think that there was such a lot in those questions. Um, so the, the immediate actions, we've established our, our, our director of our UAP research. They're, they're working um, across the whole of government. Uh, they're working very closely with ARO. Um, they are the sort of central point um, for, for all of the collaboration. I'm not sure what else you asked, I'm sorry. What mechanisms are you using to share data and information with the Defense Department? all mechanisms available to us. Um, as, as Dan eloquently said, all of our data are open and public. So actually, I mean, we share we share everything with everybody. So everybody can, can access our NASA data. I mean, do you have like a specific repository or mechanism or channel specifically with DOD where you're sharing information? Can you just expand a little on how Aero and DOD are working? So um, Aero and NASA are working so deeply to share things. Sure, do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah. sure, I'm happy to handle that. Yeah. So, so as Nikki beautifully said, uh, all of NASA's data is open and accessible to the public. If DOD on a, on a specific instance need to tap our expertise, then there are obviously secure ways of doing that. And we've you know, it, done that by appointing our liaison officer. And yes, we know how to talk to DOD in, in a classified space. But again, most of what we do is unclassified and for good reason. And the answer is actually straightforward. That Arrow is the lead agency in the government. So FAA reported events go to Arrow. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're the central collection agency. And that um, actually, if you go to the Arrow site, they have a pretty uh, complete list of things they've analyzed and, and are, are trying to make public. Um, though with Arrow, and this is just something I think is worth repeating in the context of looking at images that come from military satellites and intelligence community. It's important to remember that things are images taken by military instruments are classified, not because of what's in the image, but because of the nature of the measuring instrument. And I think this is one of the unique things that NASA brings here, is NASA is about openness and transparency. NASA's, when NASA makes measurements, NASA has a, across all that it does, this program of making its data open and available. And of course, because it's not, making measurements with classified instruments that uh, enables it to do this and that one of the things that nasa brings to this space thank you and just a really quick clarification because i think it's important um the nasa aero liaison is that official the same as your new uap head of research yes thank you all right one more in the room before we go back to the phones for a couple thank you my name is jacob jensen i work for a danish newspaper called berlinski um, my question is for Mr. Uh, Nelson. Um, you said at the beginning of the meeting that um, that NASA will be transparent. Well, a month and a half ago, Mr. David Grush said under oath in Congress 
that the U.S. government is in possession of UAPs and extraterrestrial life. Um, how can you be sure at NASA that other parts of uh, the U.S. government is being transparent? I don't speak for other parts of the government, but I can tell you NASA, which I speak for, is open and transparent with our data. Do you believe what Mr. David Brush said, or is he lying? Uh, you would want me to give a personal opinion yes, please. Uh, of what he said. Uh, uh, what he said, if I recall having seen this uh, on the nightly news, was that he had a friend that uh, knew where a warehouse was that had uh, an UFO locked up in a warehouse. He also said he had another friend that uh, said that he had parts of an alien. Whatever he said, where's the evidence is he also, my well, response. Excuse me. He also said that he did interview over 40 employees at the Pentagon. A uh, long time ago, there was a TV show, uh, Jack Friday. And he used to say, just the facts, just the facts. Show me the evidence. Thank you, sir. All right, we will go to the phones again. I, I know people have lots of questions, but I'm going to try to keep us to just to one for each person. Uh, and so next person on the phone, go ahead and introduce yourself. The next question comes from Gina Ciceri with ABC News. Your line is open. Uh, this is for Senator Nelson. Your report mentioned that AI could be very useful in helping in this investigation. How do you see that, sir? Well, why limit us in anything in uh, interpretation of data? Uh, and AI is just coming on the scene uh, to be explored in all areas. So why should we limit any technological tool in analyzing data that we have? I said AI was one of the things that we were going to employ. Uh, I mean, we actually we use AI uh, or artificial intelligence and machine learning throughout our NASA science portfolio. It is an amazing tool for helping us to actually find often signatures that signatures that are sort of buried in data. And so a lot of our data are just sort of wiggly line plots. We get excited about wiggly line plots, by the way. But um, sometimes you, 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 know, you see the wiggles and you, you miss a signal in there. And by using artificial intelligence, we can often find signatures. So one example we have, we've had is to be able to find signatures of superstorms using very old data that you know, really is before sort of uh, like routine scientific uh, satellite data. Um, and it's, it's amazing. And so just being able to use those techniques often can allow us to find things to actually find the needle. As, as David so eloquently said, once you've actually really, it also helps us to really characterize the hay. Um, and so, so you can start subtracting the hay and look for the, 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 the needles behind. So let me just take this moment to say, to try to demystify AI and ML. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when, as scientists, and probably many of you in, in high school were trained to do this, we had some data. You took your data, you drew a graph, you put a line through it. You had data in two dimensions, X and Y. Right now, we're, we, much of our data is in a much higher dimensional space. And if you're working with something like ChatGPT, it's in the, uh, a high dimensional space of language or tokens, if you want to get technical, with 12,000 tokens in the chat GPT 3.5, for example. Um, and machine learning is a powerful tool for representing functions in high dimensional space. That means we get to work with data in a high dimensional space. AI is very powerful, but it's no more powerful than the data you give it. It's a way of, you know, we've got, this is why it's very powerful, say with NASA's weather and climate data. We've got an incredible amount of data and it's data that you want to do more with than just put a line on a, on a graph. You want to extract all that information or more information in that high dimensional space. And I think we're just, just really discovering the power of that tool. And it's one of the tools 
NASA and I, you know, not just scientists, but I think a lot of people in a lot of different industries are using to learn new things about high dimensional data. But it, um, it always comes back to the data you feed into your, your uh, analysis, whether it's a line on a graph paper or a high dimensional space explored with machine learning. And if you don't got good data, you're, you're not gonna learn things. I'm gonna add one last sentence. <laughs> Sorry. High dimensional does not mean high space dimensions, not oh. interdimensional travel. We're talking about multiple parameters here, okay? Yeah. Great. We are we are coming close to time. I want to get two more questions, and we're going to do one on the phone and one more in the room. Uh, and and hopefully, if we keep our questions short and our answers short, we'll get to to those two. For anybody who's here who hasn't had a chance to ask a question, you are more than welcome to send an email, and we will try to get you questions as uh, answers as quickly as possible. So, one more on the phone, please. Yes. Our next question comes from Peggy Hollinger with Financial Times. Your line is open. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for allowing me to ask a question. I'm curious about uh, you saying here that you want to rope in crowdsourcing, but also you, you speak specifically about the potential of using commercial assets as well as your own. I'm curious about, can you just give me a bit more detail how you will do that? Will that be through commercial contracts, or will you ask for voluntary um, reporting of sightings? And, and also, I think that's when you talk a lot about the importance of sensor, I'm going to use the word harmonization, because there's no kind of harmonization between the way the sensors work. Presumably, that would be the same for the use of commercial assets. You know, how does, how does that use of commercial assets and crowdsourcing square with the sensor harmonization that you talk about? And who's going to pay for all this? Thank you. So let me just say a little bit about crowdsourcing. Much of what we have in mind is taking advantage of the fact that there's several billion of these floating around, right? And they take, I'm holding up a cell phone for those on the radio. Um, uh, they take wonderful high quality images, have high quality metadata, record local magnetic field, sound, gravitational field. There's a wealth of data that a cell phone takes and you can Imagine designing apps that make the images uh, relatively tamper-free. You can at least make it hard to do. And I think if we have a collection where interesting events are collected by citizens, uh, hosted, and you have multiple images of the same event, we will be able to learn a lot. And you know, one of the things NASA supports is citizen science. And I think that the the idea that if you see something you don't understand, collect data, we aggregate the data and we learn from it, is important in this context. And just, I think in some ways, an opportunity to engage the broader public in doing science. Great, our last question please from the floor. Thank you all for doing this. Joe Khalil with News Nation. My first question is uh, you've described harassment of some of the panelists, uh, while that is horrible and never a good thing, it does sort of come with the nature of, of public officials. You know, Mr. Nelson, as a senator, lawmakers get that kind of thing all the time. It, is that the justification for keeping this new position, director of UAP research, private? Do you plan on doing that forever? Is, is that a temporary thing? Because it seems to cut against the dedication to being open and transparent if this person forever is, is not going to be revealed or identity who they are. Yeah, okay, so uh, at the time, yes, we, we are withholding that name. Let's not forget that we've only just received this report. And what we need to do now as an agency is come together and provide a cohesive and coherent response to it that addresses multiple findings and recommendations, okay? We're only announcing initial actions today. Will that person's name be disclosed to answer your specific question? Uh, potentially, yes. But again, we need to ensure that the scientific process and method is free, okay? That's my response. Thank you. And just lastly, the report says that you relied on unclassified material. 
You've given a very um, understandable description for why the DOD classifies certain images and videos. Why did you all not have access to classified material? Uh, and could you have you know, done that? I have. So just understand that. Uh, let the committee speak for themselves. So one of the reasons that we restricted ourselves, this study, to unclassified data is because we can speak openly about it. And in so doing, we're aiming, again, to alter the discourse from sensationalism to science, as uh, Administrator Nelson beautifully said. Um, NASA personnel, as appropriate, know how to talk to DOD on a classified basis, but the purpose of this study was to tell us what open data we could use in combination with the power of science to move our understanding forward. Okay, that was the purpose, and we're speaking about it openly today. And so, one of the challenges. And you I'm afraid about. we do have to wrap up. We are at time. Uh, so, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Again, for those people who were not able to get uh, questions, I do apologize for not doing it in the room. However, please send uh, an email based on our press release. You will have information to access, and we will try to get you the answers we can. Uh, and with that, we are concluding today's press briefing. And thank you very much for being here. That was an interesting hearing, and you might ask, why do you say that? Well, first thing, being on the optimistic side, they covered something. Now, did they really share any information? No, no, they did not. They were really stressing and emphasizing being transparent, removing the stigma, but it didn't really seem like they were prepared for these questions. Some of them were great. Some of them were go-getters, like hard, hard hitters. And by the way, I will add a timeline index a little bit later today for you to follow along with the questions and who asked what. But I feel like, you know, when you have a panel, uh, you know, a, a, an open, like an open questioning panel, right? It gives you this level of confidence that I can totally answer. It's going to be so easy. And they struggled. The, the, the panel did struggle. Some of the answers were very condescending, especially for those that have been in the field for some time. And just the way that they were answering things, not all of the questions, but a good handful of them, they were speaking to the public, which, by the way, probably 99% are full-blown adults, talking to them like they were in elementary school. And I wasn't fond of that. Now, one aspect that I always enjoy watching when looking at these hearings and what was really great about this particular, like the, the cameraman was that he didn't do any zoom ins on the people. It was you got to see everyone, all of their expressions, one questions were being asked. And that's what I love, because when it comes to like body language, that's what we all want to see. The, the, those are the meta messages. So what they're saying verbally doesn't mean that they are actually thinking that and you can kind of not always we can kind of see it in their body language and we were able to see that david spurgle for instance uh, a lot of the answers that he was giving he wasn't looking at the audience he was looking at his teammates his his panel and this could be for a variety of different reasons one of them it's kind of to give him this level of confidence and support because he's kind of gauging the team's facial expressions and then he's able to speak based off of those facial expressions maybe at a subconscious level maybe he wasn't aware of that but that was something that i caught also he could have been super nervous to talk to an audience it is not easy okay like and, and and i can get that and i will give him the benefit of the doubt on that aspect or it could be both here you also saw bill nelson and nikki fox kind of being a little smug with some of their answers and kind of like smirking at each other uh with some things and, and i didn't really dig that and then you had daniel evans as well who kind of made some somewhat snarky remarks for some of these questions but the people that were asking a lot of these news outlets and james fox as well that was that was pretty exciting to see him ask the very first question a lot of them were great i think they were really listening to their opening speeches the people on the panel and uh, of course you wanted to hear about the mexico hearing and how that went it was very disappointing to hear spurgle say i didn't watch it but i saw twitter 
Twitter is not a credible source by ed- by any means, like not a single one, especially when you're attempting to formulate an opinion or get an understanding. Twitter is not the place you want to go. Yes, you can potentially find other sources there to like go into more depth. But just a, a glance, I, I I cried on the inside when I heard that. And then he says, well, they need to make the data public. They need We need to do research. During that hearing, they said that the data is public and it's open for scientists and researchers to conduct and, and collect more data. So that was a disappointing aspect right there. But the biggest takeaway from my understanding, and I would like to go into more detail tomorrow on Strange News after watching it a few more times, the biggest takeaway was that they were saying, oh, we, we're we we're super transparent. All of our data is, is going to be made public, but they wouldn't release the information on the UAP research director. Uh, they wouldn't release information on the budget. They they didn't really answer questions very straightforward. They were kind of going, they were giving you very roundabout answers. And when it came to like extraterrestrials, which is what obviously is what's on everyone's mind, there's a lot of hesitation. There wasn't this level of confidence. And a great example of this was when Nikki Fox was talking about the advancements of future telescopes to come online to to be created by NASA and to be launched. And she was very confident. She did not say, um, she didn't stutter. She was on the ball. And I was like, go you. Right. But then when she came into the aspect of ET and kind of looking for that and using resources for that, there was a lot of, um, uh, and a lot of hesitation. She wasn't really sure what to say. And I think that they should have prepared for it, mainly because that's what this briefing was about. It was a it was a UAP briefing. So I feel like they should have been a little bit more confident there, even just like pretending to be confident, um, which a lot of people do anyway. But it it I had no expectations. Did it meet any of my expectations? No, no, it didn't. But I didn't have any. So I'm not necessarily disappointed here. But I wasn't fond of the of of how the how they answered them and how they treated us like we were in elementary school. I, I didn't like that. But I would like to hear your aspects, your opinions, your insights on this hearing. Do you think it's going to change the conversation? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic here? Let me know in the live chat. Please let me know in the comments as well. I do try to read all of the comments. And as you are seeing right here on screen, it says the report that you're talking about publicly released. The link is in the video description below. You can take a look at that excuse me but that is it for this hearing do watch strange news tomorrow at 3 p.m pst we will go over this again hopefully in more detail and covering a bunch of other strange news from around the world follow me on twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news also make sure to hit the like button and let the youtube algorithm know that you want more coverage when it comes to uap ufos aliens and so much more make sure to subscribe as well as we do so many shows right here every single week live and if you want to continue this conversation bring it over to the discord server with 2,000 other like-minded members share your thoughts your insights your experiences and more i know one of my amazing moderators will share that link in the live chat that is it for today i will see you tomorrow be safe and remember keep your eyes on the skies